Hey, it's my joy just to echo a welcome that Leslie Anderson did so well this morning. We're thrilled that you're at Wellspring Church today. Our greatest hope is that you might know and love and follow Jesus Christ. He is the source of life, and I would remind you of this. Your journey of faith is to Jesus Not to a creed, not to an institution, not to a denomination. It's to Jesus Christ himself. And we want to point you to him. We exist to connect people to Jesus. We want to help you walk with him for a lifetime and beyond. And we do not want to miss that bullseye. And so hear me clearly today. Man, run to Jesus every minute of your life, every moment of your life. Listen to him speak to you and fall more in love with God the Father, Spirit, and Jesus himself. That's our hope for you today. We're in the middle of a series from Ephesians chapter 5. You want to get ready for that. We've entitled it, A Better Way of Living and Loving and Leading Our Lives Exactly as Jesus Did. This is not a new and improved version of 2019. I just need to do better than I did in 2019. No, it's a source of life that comes from Jesus himself. That he gives us power so that we might have a better trajectory of living now and for the rest of our life. And so I pray today as God speaks, you and I might hear of a better way. This is not a self-made way. It's not self-energy and ingenuity that you figure out how to be better yourself. But that you and I might follow and imitate and copy God's example. And that's what it's going to jump out in Scripture. Follow the example of God. Yes, We talked last week, how do we do that? We'll never become God, but we're going to become like Him as we follow His example. God Himself, Jesus, we celebrate His birth at Christmas time. He was born in Bethlehem, but He began to walk. In 30 years, when He was an adult, He walked with men and He gathered. Ultimately, men and women followed His life and He said, you can do this. And then at the moment that He went to a bloody and brutal, He crucified death upon a cross, He rose from the grave. And from that moment on, don't miss this, believers in Jesus Christ, followers, those who've moved from slavery to an inheritance with Him, those who've moved from dark to life, death to life, those who've now moved and said, I'm called by His name. Christ Himself places His DNA in you by His Holy Spirit. You have the capacity of God within you by the very nature of who God is and what He did. And so we don't want to miss that today. And so I pray that you might live fully forgiven. So many of you need to be set free from whatever is going on in life and live a life of freedom and live a life of power and live a life of no regrets and no retreats. And I pray from this day forward you never look back and you'd walk with Jesus in a better way. Hey, in honor of God's Word, let's stand. And we're going to read together. I I will just point out the truth of today. You can watch it on the screen. You can read it from your notes. I'm going to give you a little primer and go back to the two verses from last week. We are in Ephesians chapter 5, a letter God inspired to be written. The Apostle Paul through his pen and that of a scribe to a young church in Ephesus. 5, you'll hear me read verses 1 and 2 and then look upon a screen or in your notes or in your Bible Verses 3, 4, and 5. Lord, thank you for your word. Follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children. Oh, it's a letter of love. Man, hear that today. God's love. He wants to speak to you. Don't walk away without knowing how much you love today. And walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us, gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to Christ. Look at today's truth. Verse 3. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality, or any kind of impurity or greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, coarse jesting, joking, which are out of place, but rather be thankful with your words. Have thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person's idolater, no one of these people has any inheritance in the kingdom of God, and in Christ. Thank you, God, for the reading of your word. Please be seated. 
All right, let me unpack this. Ephesians is a circular letter. It's written by God, inspired, and Paul penned it. It's a letter that was sent to Ephesus, and so all of the believers near and around this dynamic city were getting this letter, and they're unpacking it, and they're reading it in small groups, maybe like a life group that you're involved in. Let me encourage you to be in a life group. You're going to open up this letter for the next six, eight weeks, and then your life group leader is going to continue to lead. But you can imagine being in someone's home, listening to the Word of God, Listening and praying, God, guide us, speak to us, and it becoming alive because the Word of God is living and breathing and active. Ever since God inspired, it's alive. It's alive then, 2,000 years ago, it's alive today. And we say it all the time. We want to get in the Word of God and with the Word of God to get into us. And so as this letter was being passed around, people are hearing how to live. Let me remind you, Ephesians, there's six chapters, verses or chapters one through three, speaks about right doctrine. Here is the right theology and doctrine of who Jesus Christ is, what God had intended for all of eternity, because right doctrine leads to right living. Chapters 4, 5, and 6, and we're in chapter 5. That's going to dominate our teaching for about eight weeks, just chapter 5. And it leads to right living. How do we as believers, how do we live? Once our thinking begins to be right, and Jesus says, a man thinketh, so he becomes. As our thinking begins right, it's where you start, the battle is in the mind. The battle with everything in life is in the mind. If you get right thinking, it then begins to change and lead, and you love, and your behavior is exactly as you think. And so that's the book of Ephesians in summary form. Here's what it says in the three verses today. There's a better way. It's the way of holiness. God's people are saved to be holy. If you're taking notes, write that down. And he's very clear. This is not sexually immoral, not greedy, not foul-mouthed. Hmm. Salvation is God's free gift, but it carries with it an obligation. He says, children of God, here's what I want you to know. I want you to behave from this point forward because you're my dearly loved child. I want you to imitate. I want you to, I've set the example. You can follow me means deliberately discarding the old, selfish way of life, shedding former habits, and letting the new life in Christ, His Spirit, His power within you, change the way you think and behave. You can do that. It's very clear. Paul is specific. He gives three today of some do's and don'ts. The goal, he says, we're to copy God's own character, living and loving the sacrificial life. We bear the very light of God within us. And that's a loving response to a holy, loving, powerful, almighty God. I love what it says in the commentary in Holy Scriptures. Lang is the author of this portion. He says, Neither happiness, nor pleasure, nor property is the aim and task of life. Sure seems that way in America, doesn't it? The bigger and the better and the faster survive. Let's just get more. He who wins has the most toys at the end of his life. I went to a funeral on Friday, my dear mentor and pastor. And I'm reminded, life is not about just getting more stuff, getting more fame. It's about being a servant and loving people in Jesus' name. And the Scriptures go on to say, it's the formation, the character of our life, the very stamp of God's image received in creation and renewed in you and I the moment that we're redeemed. That's the goal and task of life. Here's the second thing that jumps off. It says, don't get close to sin. This letter is very clear. Have a zero tolerance. Zero. Zero tolerance. It says, let it never be named among you. Don't let this become your reputation. Let's be clear. There's nothing new under the sun. The last five, 6,000 years, humanity, that's all of us and all the billions of people who ever walked this earth. We all are faced with lust, immorality, greed. It's all, all the time. We know that. We're honest for the Lord. We're broken. We know that. He says, this is not an absence of temptation. That's not going to stop. It's going to continue. But I'm going to challenge you as a dearly loved child of God. Make a commitment to purity. Make a commitment to holiness. And he says, so never. He uses a very strong superlative here. Never. Woo. That's a strong word. Yet that is the mandate for believers. Children of God. Look at the third one. Watch your words. Choose gratitude over attitude. In fact, while we're talking about language, look what he says. God's children shouldn't be obscene, foolish, even jokingly rough or coarse or 
sarcastic to others. I love from Zondervan's uh, handbook of the Bible, it says this, the self-centered vices in conduct and speech are the opposite of self-sacrificing love spoken about in verses 1 and 2 when Jesus gave his life up for you and I. It was a fragrant, it was an offering of praise before the Lord so that you and I might have life. It's just the opposite of that when our language is inappropriate. Improprieties of speech. I want you to look at these words, and if I were to share the Greek, here's what they mean. The word obscenity in the Greek means shameless talk and conduct. The word foolish talk means just stupid words. How often have you said something and go, oh, I'd like to take that back. That was just stupid. We all know that. Coarse jesting. Sometimes we go too far kidding around. It's vulgar, frivolous is what the Greek says. And Paul says that's out of place for Jesus' followers. People who have been consumed by the love of God and want to share that love with the world. Paul was not saying that humor in itself is sin. Man, one of the things I heard Friday at the funeral I went was this beautiful image of Jesus laughing and playing with children and embracing the disciples. Man, I hope you know that Jesus I hope you know that Jesus that loves you and wants to grace and give you mercy and wants to walk with you and give you images of going through life laughing and enjoying the mercy and the goodness of God. But many of us would say, wow, as I'm laughing, it gets out of hand. And he says, what's wrong is when we use our words to destroy or tear people down. And many of us, sarcasm's our heart language. Maybe we need to change your heart. Look at the last thing the Scripture says today. There's no inheritance for idolaters. Now, I'm going to unpack this just briefly. I wish I could take an entire sermon, but let me offer this. Paul is giving a warning here. And he gives a warning, and he says, let's not miss this. He says, this is not a statement about salvation, but rather identification. And here's the warning. He's trying to warn those who've never repented. Who've never said, I need by the grace of God to have faith to follow Jesus Christ, consume me as Lord and Savior, and I'm a new creation in Him. So, people who that has not happened to, you've not repented, he says, you rather want to identify. You want to be known by being impure, being immoral, being greedy. And he says, for you, man, there's no inheritance in the kingdom of God. For those who are known by that and want that, he says, wow, you better check your heart. And so he makes a statement here, and he says, believers are not idolaters, and we shouldn't act like them, because that's what the idolaters are, idolatry. Listen to this. Those who identify as sexually immoral, they're impure in their thinking, their speaking, their behaving, their greed, their desires. That's rooted in worshiping the creation. I have a hunger, desire, pursuit of the creation more than the Creator. And I want what I want, when I want, for my pleasure, and no, He can, can't speak about it. You've just made all of that an idol. And God says, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Ooh, a lot said in these few brief passages from God's Word. So before I say amen and go home, I want to just unpack a bit. And I pray you hear God speak love to you and possibly conviction, freedom, an overwhelming sense of guilt, and a reminder you can release that guilt at the foot of the cross and by His grace. So why would living this way, not immorally, not impurely, not with words that are coarse and rough and vulgar, why is greed not the way we want to live? How is that a better way? Why would you want to live that way? Ask yourself that question. Why would God ask his dearly beloved children to act that way? Well, let's not forget. God wants the very best for you and I. Amen. God is loving and merciful and gracious and good and forgiving and powerful. He's also truthful and he's sovereign and he's holy and much more. Amen. And God wants you and I to live a better way. Amen. John 10.10 10 says this, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Oh, man. Jesus says, I've come to give you life. I've come to give it to you abundantly, to the full. I want you to live the very greatest life because I've created you in my image, and I want the most for you. And there is an enemy, and he's trying to take the most out of you. 
so that you live the least life. God does not want that for you. God has come that you might have the fullest of life. We learned in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 last week, God backed his love up for you and I with a commitment. Listen again to what I said last week. God gave his one and only son, that was a gift of love, to die a sacrificial death on a cross to cover our sin. That's an act of love. And he rose from a tomb to crush death and bring life. That's the power of love. And then he places his spirit within you and I. That's the presence of love. So Paul is going to use here in these few verses a grammatical method. Any English teachers in the room today, any school teachers who went back to school, you've been back a week, you're counting the days down until summer break. All right. All right. A couple of you here. All right. He's going to use this method, and what he's going to do is he's going to create a series of opposites. So, you know, this is one thing. Oh, this is clearly not the other. So that it becomes very radiant. It's, it's expressive, and we don't miss because it's magnified. What's the difference? And he says there's a difference between God's love and the world's love. And he says God's love is self-sacrificing versus human love. Human love often is solely sexual. It's non-committal often in God's design for marriage, and it's often self-indulgent. It's just sensual. It's all about pleasure. Think about this. We use the word love to describe several things, don't we? I love my wife. I love uh, the food that I eat and the car that I drive. I just love it. Isn't that amazing that the word that I would use regarding my commitment, by the way, for the last 30 years, 30 years, sacrificial, self-giving. It should be, she does the same thing with me, and I'm grateful for that. That word ought to be set apart so different than my love for Barrow's Pizza. And can I get an amen for pepperoni? That's amazing. Or my new Mercedes car that I'd love to drive the rest of my life. I mean, that's a different kind of love, isn't it? But we use that word. I love those things. I love the new Star Wars movie. Oh, I love the popcorn I got. Love. God's love. The way of God. It was given by his life, death, and resurrection. It was sacrificial, selfless. It was giving. That was the way of love. The opposite? Well, there's a lousy way. There's a lousy way of life. And it's self-indulgent. It's authored by Satan himself. Man, it's, it's about taking, not giving. It's about pleasure now, not waiting. It's about self-indulgent, disrespect of others and clearly of God. I want you to look at a word on the screen. This is the word covetousness. It comes in the scripture. We're not to be coveting someone else's wife, their dog, their house, their money, their life, anything. This is the word. I can't pronounce that word. It says, here's what it is. The word exudes this feeling. And so go with me here. The word describes the desire within someone's heart. When you covet something, you don't just want it for a day. You want it deep within your soul. And so that's the word that's coming out here. And he says, this is not just an outward expression, no matter how crude or selfish or vulgar or sensual or immoral or greedy it might be. He says there's something going on in the heart, not just a one-time act. And he says that's not what God's people are like. See, the heart matters most. Jesus constantly talked about the heart. He says ultimately the outside begins to look like the inside. That's the beauty of the Christian life. Many of us would stand today and give testimony and grace to God. Man, I am not where I want to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. Amen? Because God has done a work on us. And he's taking all this junk and mess that all of us have. And there are times we still struggle. But man, he's doing a work of beauty to change us from the inside out because he changed our heart. He took our heart and he turned it from stone to one of flesh. And he said, I want to do a work within you. And that's what God would say again today. He wants to do a work deep within your heart of salvation and sanctification. That's a theological word. To make you pure and right and holy is what that describes. And that takes a while. It doesn't just happen overnight. I praise God. There are people in this church, man, the day they realize I have been an addict all my life. I've been drinking and drinking. And I can't say no anymore. I need God to heal me. I'm admitting it. And the next day they were set free. But most people, it's forever until you get to heaven. And you have to admit every day, yes, 
I have a longing to drink. I want to medicate my pain. I just want to escape. I want to get everything. And man, drink it. That seemed, I've taken that as an answer. I, I'm, an, I'm an alcoholic. I've been sober for a year. But I'm still not. I've been sober 10 years. I've been sober for 40 years. But you still have to say, man, the work of sanctification might be happen instantly, but it might be a journey till Jesus returns. But it is a work that does not stop because the power of God, the Holy Spirit within you, and the Word of God guiding you can bring you to a place where your heart is pure and holy and your actions reflect that. Guard your heart. Out of it flows the wellspring of life. What a wise statement. So you're sitting there saying, okay, pastor, all this is good. Wow, noble and fantastic, and I'd love to do it. So you're just telling me, I just need to stop all this if it's part of the pattern of my life. Do I just need to do better in 2020 than I did in 2019? When I'm struggling with my language, do I just need to stop cursing? Do I need to stop when I'm sarcastically just putting people down? What about all that stuff that I want? Man, I'm in place trying to get it. I don't want it bad. I need it. Man, I'm, I, I'm willing to go to all extremes to get it. Do I just need to stop? And then what about all those moments that, boy, school and work and church, I'm living a godly lifestyle, but man... People knew what I did after dark. I have the most ungodly acts are coming out of my life, my body, my thoughts. Do I just stop all that? Hmm. How do I do better? And so I want to be your pastor and lovingly offer some thoughts today. This is what jumps from Ephesians chapter 5. Last week we said, Jesus set the example and said, follow my example. It's the way of love. It's a way we would ask a question. What would my love for God and my love for others do at this moment when I'm facing daily decisions, when I'm making decisions about relationships, when I'm facing temptations that seem to come at no end and around every corner, when the battle of my mind is raging, what would I do? And I would say, let's ask the question, what would love for God and acknowledgement His love for me and His design and request, His love for others, what would I do at these moments to live a better life. And I want to offer a twofold kind of question that you can ask today, tomorrow, and every day that God gives you life until Jesus returns. Here's the questions. If you truly love God and you begin to ask, because of my love for God and who He is, and that I'm a child of God and His love for me, can I do the right thing? Well, there should be reason enough to say, yes, I can. He's given His Spirit. I can... I love God so much. My gosh, He's holy. I would not want to be unholy. I want to revere Him. My sheer obedience to Him is good and right. I'm willing to surrender what I want now for what He wants always. I want to honor Him. Well, that first question is high and holy, and it's possible. And I want to put that before us today. Here's the second question. Man, because of God's love and His love for people, and my desire to show my love. Jesus seems to clearly say it's equivalent. Our measure of love for God is how we show that love and live that love out in our marriage, with our children, with the teachers, those in authority in my life, with those that I work, for those who I defend, for those that I embrace in one-time moments at the grocery store or the movie theater. How do I love? Well, each person is made in the image of God. So respecting and loving, God would say, Show your love now. How would you live a better way in those moments? Let's use lying, for example. Let's use lying, for example. Why should Christ followers tell the truth and not lie? Why don't you just think about that? Why should we tell the truth? Well, first, God commands it. God commands, tell the truth. And so if we love God, we'll obey right? I mean, it's that simple. If we really, really love God, and if we love God and know of His love for us, we're going to love others. And why is telling the truth an expression of love? I'm going to borrow some language from a book called Irresistible. And it's written by Andy Stanley, a pastor in Houston. He says, in Atlanta, he says this, first of all, lying dishonors the person to whom you told the lie. 
Lying says that protecting me is more important than honoring you. Ooh. Lying devalues the recipient. See, lying says you're not worth telling the truth. Ooh. Lying breaks the relationship. Relationships are built on trust. Anybody that's been in a relationship knows that. Man, if you have no trust, you've got no relationship. And lying cuts in half the relationship. It breaks it. It destroys trust. And so when you ask, why should children of God not lie? God commands, and we can end right there. Yes, loving God. But look how much it damages people who are made in the image of God. For Christ's followers, words like honor and value and worth and relationship, they mean something, don't they? They mean something. So when you and I had a broken relationship with God, He came as the truth to restore honor, value, and worth in your life and mine. He did that as an act of love. So each time the issue of truth, we're just talking about that right now, when truth is on the line, it's a question of whether we love God. Do we love God enough to tell the truth and to honor the people we're speaking to? Do we love God enough to follow His example? Now, lest you are sleeping and not paying attention, I'm getting to a part that's going to touch every person in this room. The same holds true. You ready? For gossiping, stealing, cheating, adultery, coveting, cursing, greed. You want to put your sin on the list? The same holds true. I mean, do I really need a checklist and a Bible study and one verse that says pornography is dishonoring to God and bad for me? I don't need that. I realize that, man, if I'm involved in pornography, it's wounding my wife. If I'm not married, it's wounding me and my potential future spouse. It tears at the very foundational relationship of the holy God. It puts things between me and God, and I'm not able to hear and receive His blessing in my life. And ultimately, it has the potential to become first. I become addicted. It's Lord, Master. It becomes the love of my life. It's an idol. And so do I need something specific that says, hey, get away from porn? No. Man, I know when I ask this question, what would God's love mean related to that? What would God's love mean related to how I express that to others? I would really say, man, it is clear that if I love God, that is not going to be part of my life. And so since this passage speaks a lot about sex and the world is talking a lot about sex, let's talk for a minute. I want to talk biblically, purely, practically, and openly. What does the Bible say about sex? And lovingly, in more than one place, God says this. Sex is to be passionately enjoyed as a gift of intimacy in the context of biblical covenant and committed marriage of one man and one woman. Everything else is immoral and godly and selfish. The Bible says that in more than one place. You can ask questions about how far is too far in dating. Our students may talk about that next week when they fight the good fight and disciple now. People have been asking this for 6,000 years. What if uh, partners agree or it's consensual? Well, what about same gender sexual expression? What about self gratification? Well, let's ask. What would love for God and others ask me to do? Because he's speaking today very clearly. I'm not running from this text. I wish I could gloss over it and tell you all the things you go home and say, hey, I'm fine with it. I'm going to speak, and man, it is convicting for all of us. First, when we talk about sexual purity and the biblical ethic, here's the first thing. Let's go back to our twofold question our love for God. What would love mandate that I do? Love for God, love for others. Well, it's clear. Our loving God has given clear direction and His Holy Spirit within us, the ability within us to live a holy life according to the direction. It is possible to live a sexually pure life. It is possible. By the very presence of God within you, you can live purely. And man, for the glory of God, He would ask that for us. Let's go to the second one. Man, if our love for God is expressed equally in our love for others, what would love have me to do regarding my sexuality? What about sex outside of marriage? Let's ask the questions. Doing anything that might diminish someone's potential for intimacy with a future spouse is not good for them or their future spouse. Intimacy is fueled by exclusivity, not experience. 
I wish every person would hear that. And young people, I'm going to stop and pray for you here in a minute because there's no harder time to grow up through adolescence and puberty and sexuality and the age of sexuality than ever before. It's the most difficult time in history. Nothing new under the sun. People struggled with it 5,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. The church in Corinth was struggling with it. And Paul speaks about it in his letter to them. But I would tell you, man, there is a struggle, but we can win. Sex before marriage robs both parties of that which is intended for future spouses. It robs a future spouse of the comfort and the confidence that in knowing, hey, you saved yourself for them, a partner solely for them. So, sex outside of marriage, you, your current partner, any future spouse, I want you to notice everybody loses. Nobody wins. Okay, students, I want you to listen up. Several of you here, several growing up in my home, I love you. I want you just to hear very clearly. If you go around sleeping with lots of people, friends, some one-night moments, uh, folks that you don't know about, and your future spouse says, hey, did you ever have sex with so-and-so? You're going to be tempted to lie at that moment. Sure you are. Most likely you will. And so I want you just to ask the question. You think about, man, is your sexual behavior now with people that you hope to never see again, you're sure not going to do life together, is that setting you up to lie to the very person you're going to do life with and see every day of your life, your spouse. So if you answer that question honestly, wow, do you want to live with lies the rest of your life? No. And So related to this, here's the bottom line. God gives us a clear, loving mandate regarding sexual ethic for all of us. And he says this, anything outside of marriage is wrong. It's a sin. It causes spiritual pain. It gets between you and God. It harms people made in the image of God. And Jesus died for them on the cross to protect them and love them. What do you gain from sex outside of marriage? Nothing. Nothing. What harm is done? Potentially great. Is there pressure to have sex? Absolutely. Man, I do not have my head in the sand. These students are facing pressure like never before. And man, potentially, you do not want to be seen as weird, uninformed, or inexperienced. And that pressure is every single day, starting about fourth or fifth grade. For some of us in the room, it was, wow, when I got to the military and began working. Then for some, a generation or two later, it was, boy, about the time of college. Then a generation or two later, it was in high school. You can imagine, in elementary school, that's shocking. But that's the reality of our world today. Being sexually active falsely gives acceptance among some crowds. And for a few moments, it does give physical pleasure. But everyone who's seeking pleasure perhaps uh, is just simply escaping or medicating the pain you have in life. And so the few moments of pleasure now, they leave quickly. And they're followed by lots of pain. And that doesn't leave so quickly. I read an article and I couldn't find it. I wish I could. It was from a young girl who'd had several sexual partners in college. She'd stopped, and because she'd come to faith, and she, what she learned was not only was she pleasing to God, but she began to look back, and she described what happened. In all those moments, for two or three years, she was sexually active. She said she has a lot of regret, and God is healing that. She, the whole time, was longing for something better. She wanted to give her heart to something that might last, and ultimately she realized partner to partner to partner wasn't. But then it led to this, deep anger. She was mad. She felt like somebody was just taking advantage of her, taking advantage of who she was from the inside out, and it left deep holes of pain. She described all of that. And that's what happens when we were outside of God's biblical ethic. And as children of God, God would say, I want to protect you, guide you, and set you free from all of that. So to the students in the room right here, let me just acknowledge a couple of things. Your generation has the ability to test drive almost everything. You do very little on blindness or ignorance because you're the first generation that has instant access to information all over the world immediately. See, via the Internet, you can experience everything first. And if you don't like it, you return it. I found out from Brian Doddridge helping me with this sermon this week. Hey, Amazon has a try-before-you-buy prime wardrobe. Anybody using that right now? You can actually buy them stuff, try on all the clothes, wear it off. You don't like it, you send it back. And Amazon says, according to their, uh, their uh, internet, says about 25, 30% of all the clothing that people buy, they return. They just send it back. 
And so more than ever before in history, you, you're not only fighting normal, crazy, raging hormones, and everybody in the room goes, I know what those are. Even that 75 years ago, I remember what those hormones are like. Okay? That's real. And you have a desire for acceptance. That's real. You also expect to experience almost everything before you try it. And I would tell you this, that's a pitfall to your purity. And God would want you to wait. God would say, hold on. There is something better. You don't have to try before you buy. Wait, I've got something better and best for you. There is a better way. Man, the biblical mandate today, wow. It is simple. It is not complicated. But my goodness, is it demanding. It is very demanding. It will require the power of Christ in you to have victory and to be obedient. It will require that. And so I'm going to stop for just a minute and do two things. I just want to pray for our current students and generation that God would give them power. And all of us, your parents and grandparents, be aware and be prayerful for the days ahead. And then I'm going to say something to us as children of God. Let's pray. Father, I just want to pray for this generation amidst all of the pitfalls uh, that they face. Man, the one regarding sexual purity is just overwhelming them. I pray you give them strength and peace and purity and guide their hearts and their minds and guard them in Christ Jesus and give them living power, Lord. And I pray that the enemy would not rob them. I pray that the enemy would not make them victims of any single thing. And I pray you give them victory. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want to talk to you just these final few minutes. I want to stop and say something. I've said it three times at Wellspring Church. I remember the first time I said it, we were at Mabel P., and I was about 30 seconds into what I'm about to say here, and there wasn't a dry eye in the room. There was just such a deep gasp, and there were some people that were so moved emotionally. And so I just say this with God's grace, and I pray His Spirit speaks. First of all, I am so sorry to every single person in the room who's ever been a victim if you've ever been violated, if you've had someone break your heart, your soul, your body, and your mind, and I am so sorry, you've been an abuse of sexual, uh, someone taking advantage, and I'm sorry. I'm also brokenhearted for many who bear the pain and the guilt because you took advantage of someone. You robbed the intimacy or the innocence of someone and maybe even today you're addicted to sex or porn or your thought life is not pure. And that breaks my heart. As a child of God, he wants more for you. Well, the Bible says this, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Man, this is one area the enemy's had a field day with all of us, hasn't he? And so there should be much grace abounding. Because he who's received much grace can extend much grace. And God would say this, man, let Jesus do a work in all of us. So let me offer some hope and some healing and good news. You came today hoping to hear good news. Here it is. Man, look to Jesus. Look to Him and run to Him. We sang a song earlier about that. Let Him take all that you are and bring everything, your past and all of that's happened, and bring wholeness and purity and completeness. Let Jesus restore the value and the beauty and the worth of your life. Let, me, let Him remind you that you're beautifully and wonderfully made. Your worth is priceless. And that God deeply desires a relationship with you. Oh, I pray you hear that today. If you were to ask this question, what would love have me to do right now? Let me offer three things. They'll be on your notes and on the screen. There is a better way. It's holiness in action. One, confess. Keep a short tab on sin because confession is powerful and it works. Don't simply sweep the guilt or the conviction under the rug. Man, bring it straight to the Father, your sin, and agree with Him, and then receive His cleansing. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive our sin, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, man, it's like a spiritual bar of soap. Lord, I want that. Make me clean, and He will. Two, consider seeking counsel if there's habitual sin in your life. Man, I marvel and I, I applaud men who are bold enough to say, I have struggled, Pastor. Help me. And they're open and they're up front and they've sought counsel. That's the way to truth and freedom. Because here's the deal. Satan rules over dark spaces and concealment. Anytime there's sin in the dark, it's going to stay there until you bring light upon it. 
And so today, seek counsel for habitual sin. It may be as simple as confessing your sin to a brother or a woman to a woman, a sister. James 5 says, confess your sin one to another. You may be healed. It's typically far more, it's better to simply confess your sin openly and seek forgiveness and guidance than for you to cover your sin and ultimately it's discovered and there's embarrassment and there's pain and sometimes great consequence. But I would encourage you, confess. Be part of the remedy and the redemption that God wants to bring in your life. And so wise people seek counsel. So if you need help or expertise from a counselor, a pastor, minister, then seek it. That is a wise thing to do. The shame is not in bearing your sin. I'm a sinner and broken. The shame is in burying your sin and living in bondage the rest of your life. God does not want that for you. And I lovingly want to help set you free. If somebody had a ball and chain, man, I'd do whatever it took to cut that off your leg and to set you free and not make you a slave. I would do that. God's Word is saying He wants to do that in every area of our life. Last thing, run to Jesus. Receive His grace. Respond to God's saving grace and move into the inheritance that He desires for you. And so identify with His Spirit, not with a reputation of impurity and greed and immorality. Run to Jesus. Don't run away. Run to Him. Let Him work on all the areas of your life and that might hinder holiness. Let Him radiate through you. Jesus is the source that brings life out of death. And His power is unending. He can clean up your language. He can turn your desires from covetousness and greed to one of blessing. And He can sure change a passionate desire for the things of this world to Him and Him alone. And the things that are out of this world. Is there a better way? Yes, there is. So even when we struggle with perfection, Jesus constantly says this, will you follow me and go in the right direction? So that's the real question today. What direction are you heading? What direction do you need to go in now? God would say there's a better way. It's my way of love. It's a way of holiness. And I invite you to follow. Let's pray.